Good morning. Good morning. My name is Christina Honchel. I'm the administrator here at All Saints Church, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, very excited to have you here for this special Rector's Forum this morning. Um, All Saints Church has decades of um, experience and loving participation in this journey that we're on, and uh, to move us beyond inclusion and into the... Um, into the uh, beloved community. So this morning we have some wonderful young leaders who I will tell you about in a moment, but let me do the housekeeping stuff first. Um, if you are new to All Saints, if you're visiting this morning, welcome. We're very glad you're with us. We would love to have you give us your name and email address on the green sheets over here by the door so that we can keep you apprised of other presentations, forums, and adult education presentations that are coming up. If you need a restroom, we're having, uh, we're restroom challenged this morning. We have some kind of leaking going on in the women's restroom on this level. But please know there are restrooms on all three levels. There is an accessible restroom in the trailer. So uh, the trailer is right over here. And at the welcome table on the lawn, please stop and pick up a welcome bag, a red welcome bag full of information about programs and ministries here at All Saints, all the things you need to get going in our life here. We're very glad you're with us. Want to talk about our action. Every Sunday we're committed to taking action. And this Sunday we invite you to sign a letter, this is very timely, to your members of Congress in support of the Disclosing Official Spending at Presidential Businesses Act. Uh, public reports have revealed that the president is profiting from his presidency. This may not be news to you. And uh, this legislation would require speedy public disclosure of any official expenses at any privately held company owned either in whole or part by any president or a trust controlled by the president. This is legislation that our friend Adam Schiff has brought forward and we want to be helpful as much as we can to everything that Adam wants to do. So. Um, Finally, it's your generosity that makes this morning and all mornings possible. We're in giving season. We would love to have you give us your 2020 pledge while you're here this morning, or take home a pledge card and pray about it and consider it and bring it back. Um, we depend on your generosity to con allow us to continue to spread justice and healing in a community and a world that needs it so badly. So as I said, we have some uh, young, wonderful young leaders to present to you this morning. This is part of our LGBTQ visioning team, which has been working over the last year or so, and many of you participated in a survey they did. We'll have some, we'll talk about that, do some talking about pronouns, and take some questions. I'm going to introduce to you Thomas Diaz, who is part of our vestry. He is a lem. You see him up on the chancel on Sunday mornings giving you communion and, um, and has been part of this visioning team. He also is very involved in our Getting Connected ministry, which is in the next room, for bringing uh, people, new members into the church and also uh, reinvigorating the faith life of people who've been here a while. I'm going to let him introduce Hannah and Ella to you, but I will just say that you... Um, you see Hannah singing in Canterbury Choir, you see Ella with the Acolytes, you see them around a lot, and uh, you should be very uh, thrilled that your church has the kind of leadership that we have with this team. So, and, and just have to say that Hannah did probably the most popular podcast we've ever done here, ASC Podcast. You want to go on our YouTube channel or our website and find that. It's about pronouns, and it is brilliant. So, thrilled to welcome these uh, wonderful leaders of your community to you, and I'm now going to turn it over to Thomas. Good morning. Um, it's a joy uh, to be with you this morning. I'm so pleased the crowd we had. I honestly didn't know what to expect, and this is fantastic, so thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Thomas Diaz. I use he, him pronouns, and I identify as a cis gay male. And I've been here at All Saints for roughly under a year and a half, so relatively still new and really got involved uh, quickly, uh, <laughs> which uh, happens. Um, I'm not here alone. I have two uh, partners for who are part of the vision team here. Uh, Hannah Earnshaw, who's been part of the co-designer of the survey, and they have been so instrumental in designing it, so I just wanna say thank you to Hannah for that. 
and Ella Baker, who is also part of our vision team, and she will be gracefully um, giving us our her transitioning story here at All Saints Church. And so we, we thank Ella for, for doing that for us. Um, so before I begin, I want to, to send a note of acknowledgement and, and appreciation for the prayers and well wishes um, that all of you have sent to me while I, uh, on my trip to DC. Um, two Sundays ago, I was commissioned at the uh, 9 a.m. service to go and be a witness in front of the Supreme Court uh, for the October 8th oral hearings for the three LGBTQ um, Title VII cases that were taken up that day. And I, I've been to the Capitol uh, several times, and this one by far uh, left me with just beyond inspired about the, the work that has been done, I think, just in our nation's history for LGBTQ issues. Uh, I was out there Monday and Tuesday of that, uh, that week, the 7th and 8th of October, and to spend pretty much 12 hours on my feet in front of the Supreme Court, and it was just a gathering of all sorts of organizations, and we rallied, we protest, we stand in solidarity to uh, protesters who were doing a peaceful civil disobedience on the streets. Um, I got to go into the chambers, which is... a uh, Wow, powerful um, experience, to say the least, with that. Uh, but what was very apparent on that particular week is there's something about visibility. Um, and I think LGBTQ folks like myself, it's a constant fight to allow us to have that visibility to go out there. And often it's when we have to gather to protest versus a time just to celebrate who we are. Um, and that particular Tuesday was both. It was both fighting for our rights and we also were celebrating our identity and celebrating who we are um, as God's creation. So it was just a momentous ex um, for a moment for the LGBTQ folks. And um, so thank you, uh, I, you came with me. Uh, I have to share something was really unique. Uh, at all times I had uh, what my vestry pin on uh, Mary, I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> and um, what was so surprising was that I would be walking the streets of DC and I would have people kind of just glance at it because it kind of has this kind of unique purple color to it. I would have people approaching me saying, oh, Saints Pasadena? That Susan Russell? Oh, I've heard about that Mike Kinman who preaches there. So we have people watching streaming probably right now from DC. And so it was just, again, um, we are that movement of assuring people that we are that radical inclusion church. And I think people are reaching out um, probably where it's not offered in their communities and they're coming to us. So um, that again was just a really deep impression on me. So thank you for your prayers and thoughts when I was out there. So moving along, um, so we're here as the vision team um, which uh, Christina said we've been gathering for about a year now. And one of the reasons why we gathered was we wanted to look at what is it um, that the LGBTQ ministry um, has done in the past and what is it going to be in the future. So we spent the first couple of months actually reviewing um, the history. And one of the things I want to acknowledge is galas. Um, Galas was the, probably the most instrumental piece for Osteen's Church and really speaking about what does radical inclusion look like. And Galas was the initial start of that. So there are many of you in the room who either engaged in Galas or was part of that leadership. And I want to applaud you and thank you because what we're doing today, yes, thank you, applaud for that. Um, it's really instrumental. And what we're doing now as a vision team is seeing what is the next you know, part look like. This is a continuum. And how do we now regenerate a ministry where we're now looking at the current needs of LGBTQ issues and how do we now acknowledge maybe some places where we needed maybe just a shift or just a little, you know, change so that we can really focus on one of our core values being radical inclusion. So once we kind of went through a review, um, we discussed like how we're now going to go and pretty much measure what we've done good and what are some things we need to learn from. Uh, so I approached the team and suggested that we do a survey. And the response was, great, do you want to design it? 
And I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> It was just a suggestion, so I took on this total order of, of creating a survey. And again, Hannah and Shaw, they, they have been instrumental for me, so thank you for your collaboration. Um, so we went to work, and we thought, okay, if we're going to survey, what is it that we're trying to measure? Um, but we really said, we know what, we're going to explore. And there were really three things that we were exploring um, in the survey. One was, how are we currently identifying as an LGBTQ ministry? And I think what we were looking at was just this transition from galas um, into really present moment um, experiences. And we also wanted to pay attention to just how people were describing the LGBTQ ministry. And so we did that. The second was that we looked at some positive experiences that were happening. And we wanted to hear of the history uh, that people wanted to share with us. And, the last part were deltas. And I can explain to you what that term means. Um, I'm a ground theory researcher. And what we do with deltas is we look at the research that's telling us something. It's, te it's a teachable moment when we're looking at data that's trying to gear us to something else. So we wanted to look at things that were teaching us about what are some things that we're missing? What are some marks that we maybe we've been ignoring? Um, and how can we then bring that back into a working ministry? So we did those three explorations in the survey. And so during this previous uh, June, which was, happens to be Pride Month, uh, we felt that was a great time to kind of initiate the survey out into our parish, and so we did. Uh, we closed it about mid-July, and then a result committee um, convened together and. Hannah and Ella were part of it, and then Vera Drew as well. And we, so numbers are, is we had 66 participants uh, who completed this survey. To be transparent, I was hoping for a little bit more. <laughs> but we'll, we'll take what we have. And I have to say that even with the 66, uh, 66 participants, um, really healthy results really came from that. Um, so, to say what is the result of the survey is actually under one umbrella. And that result is equal visibility. That was the common theme throughout all the results that were coming in from the survey was equal visibility. And that is not to say that All Saints Church has not been good at that, because we know that's true. But I think what we're hearing is that, and there can, and it happens too, I think, in all sorts of organizations, is that there might be this form of complacency that happens, that we maybe we have enough visibility and we're good. I think what we're living in is an era and a time where there are folks coming who are searching for a place where they can be their authentic self. They're looking for sanctuary, uh, and they're looking for that place where if I come to church or if I come to the spiritual place, Am I visible? Or am I that just person in, that has to sit in the back um, and just kind of write out the service and then leave? And we know that at Old Saints Church, we, we're, we're not doing that. We're doing the opposite. And the survey was telling us that's what we're doing and to continue that work. So equal visibility was pretty much the theme of our results. And we had to now go into of how can we now break this down so what exactly do we need to pay attention to? So there were a few um, kind of subjects that came out of it. The first one was um, there were quite a few participants who were stating, can we have a full-time ministry? Now, I first want to say that we do have a, a full-time ministry because it's all of you. You are the full-time ministry here at All Saints Church and for LGBT, LGBTQ folks who come um, and come to visit us or kind of explore their spirituality. We are that full-time ministry. What the results were saying is, can we make that more visible so that when folks are coming in, they see that there is a workable ministry that is maybe has full-time could also mean that there's a full-time leadership team, committee, um, a monthly gathering of LGBTQ folks, um, maybe under a leadership umbrella. And so 
that is what we would say is the next progress, is really developing a place where we can now reignite, I think, what Galas did for so many years, and that is let's have a now continued functioning ministry where we can start plugging in events, especially if it's like a once a month, um, just really gathering of folks, uh, even our allies, to come and maybe review uh, an issue that's happening out, um, out in the community or uh, even to celebrate um, a, a, an identity uh, within our community as well. So that was the, one of the breakdown for equal visibility was that can we get back to maybe this kind of full-time ministry and we have the appropriate people who are kind of steering that. The second one was there was this call for more liturgy services around LGBTQ um, celebrations and remembrance, uh, which I personally think is a brilliant idea. Uh, we actually had suggestions about, let's, should we have a service about on National Coming Out Day, which just previous was um, this few weeks ago. Um, uh, can we have um, a transgender visible visibility day as well as a service? And so I think what we're hearing is that part of that equal visibility part is we also want to have visibility when it comes to our services, our worship, and our prayer. Um, another suggestion was that to hold a, um, a prayer group as well, um, to come and pray for those who have died of suicide, uh, those who have been uh, murdered, especially our transgender uh, black women, um, which we are doing during uh, in November, November 20th is the National Transgender Day of Remembrance, and we have a committee already um, geared up under the direction of Ms. Melissa Hayes, and we'll be uh, putting together a um, really a memorial service at this point for, I believe it's 21, uh, 21 transgender black um, women who have died by murder. So, um, so I think what we're seeing is that there probably was. A, a time and place where this was a consistency, where events were happening, and maybe we're just hearing that there's a gap. And so can we just kind of get back on gear uh, and offering of, of these services? The, another part was about supportive community. And that actually came up a lot. A lot of folks were saying, is there a supportive community where I can go and one, reconcile my faith, feel a, a, a kind of a sense of sanctuary. Um, and then a, and the third was, like, have a place at the table. That came up three times, which I thought was really unique. And I, so I think we're gearing is that it's not that Old Saints Church has not been that supportive community. It's that we're, we have to be paying attention to, I think, the new generation of folks who are coming to church, who are coming and seeking out a place to do a, really, a review of that trauma, traumatization that they had um, from maybe from other religi religious institutions. And part of that, to kind of bring in some trauma framework, in order for that to happen, we have to provide the space for individuals to tell their story. That's like the first step for healing, is telling your story. And an example of that was this uh, past Lent, um, there was a small group that I led called Let's Believe Together. And really the, the foundation goal of that group was to come uh, for the five weeks of, of Lent and tell your story. That's all you did. And we had a, a, a commitment with each other that this was uh, meant to, you know, that there was confidentiality in the room and that this was a place for you to fill kind of that sanctuary place of just be your authentic self, tell your story. And my goodness was that healing and transformation for all of us in the room. I think we need more of that. Um, and that needs to be offered and it also needs to be visible in our bulletins, on our webpage, uh, you know, pretty much plastered throughout All Saints because that's when you, it, we become more of a committed, serious place. They're saying, no, we, it's not that we're, we're going beyond the affirming part. We're going to say we're that supportive group and we are going to take care of the first steps of reconciling your faith and your trauma as well. So that, again, all of these are still gearing up towards equal visibility. The last part was um, adult education, like we're doing this morning. Um, and that came from actually our allies, 
our allies are asking us, we kind of know what it means to be an, you know, a, a supportive uh, person, but sometimes I'm scared to approach somebody, especially somebody who's maybe going through transitioning, somebody who maybe is still struggling with the idea of why do we use pronouns in our introduction, our self-introduction. Um, and then also we heard that we heard that allies just want to know, can we just come and listen to your stories? Because um, maybe we're biased to what we know, we know, we don't know what's going on. So that I think would gear to say that as part of that supportive community piece, we also have to pay attention to how are we um, kind of evolve, uh, well, welcoming our allies into that process as well. And again, maybe considering looking at uh, creating programs such as this morning where maybe it's just allies in the room and we have folks like myself um, telling you our story or telling you this is the best approach uh, to an individual who's maybe struggling with their identity. So those are some kind of pieces that were going on together with that. The deltas, again, which is that learning piece that was coming from the survey, was a couple of things. One was we're not necessarily listening to how people want to experience a uh, kind of like a personal spiritual beginning here at All Saints. And I think, and that is to say, that is a tall order. Because when you have folks who are coming out from various parts of Christian denominations or even of no faith, to meet them where they're at is a challenge. But we can, that's a challenge that we can meet for sure. And I think that kind of goes back to, let's kind of gearing back to a, again, that kind of functional full-time ministry, which is all of us here in the room. And then also a part where there's a place where we can start um, kind of resourcing people when they're coming through the doors of Old Saints saying, if this is a place that you want to have that experience, here's where you go. Um, and again, that kind of connects to our supportive community uh, piece as well. The other part that the survey did not consider at all, and that's just something maybe that just happens when you're designing something from scratch, um, is that it didn't serve our CYF uh, ministries here. Our children and family ministries were not really this survey wasn't geared to maybe um, be user-friendly for them. And that, though, is something we need to pay attention to and actually go now to our youth here and listen to them and hear their experiences of, of either um, identifying the, their authenticity within the LGBTQ um, identities and also listen to our families as well. I think that is an important piece for us if, to kind of gear back to um, kind of this work world ministry where we're including all the parts of All Saints Church that we do pay attention to our children and family uh, ministries. So that is something that we're going to be kind of working on in the near future with that. So really the recap of all of that just kind of throughout you um, is that we're just now working towards that, that equal visibility part. And that is work that ha doesn't necessarily start at a certain place. It kind of starts like now here in the room. It starts whenever you gather around LGBTQ folks and listen to their story. It starts when you hear something on the news and that troubles your heart and you do something about it. That's, what we, that's when it starts. For here as a ministry, I think the next phase of the vision, the vision team is gonna work on is starting at looking at how can we now form a, um, a committee where we have a very diverse uh, leadership, um, which really we're meeting all the acronyms of our LGBTQ identities. And looking at if we were to get this committee together, um, probably start with the first thing is let's look at events, let's look at small groups, let's look at um, ways that we can also reach out to other parts of our community as well. Uh, this should not just be you know, exclusive to uh, all Saints, this should be inclusive to the rest of the community as well. So that's where we're at. Um, it, it's still a work in process and when you're dealing with data that's coming from, you know, from 66 individuals. And I also think we're kind of trying to read in between the lines as well, because those 66 also is a contribution of all of us in the room as well. 
Um, we do have a few kind of ongoing small groups, well, one small group, I should say, uh, that both uh, Terry Moore and Hannah and Shaw are, uh, are kind of in constantly doing a consistency on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. And we, they are, well, I guess I'll let you announce the anniversary if you want to do that. Yeah. Okay, you want to do that real quick? Yeah, um, hello, I'm Hannah, and um, the kind of current iteration of the LGBTQ small group is going to be turning one year old very soon. Um, so we're going to celebrate that by having an anniversary party on Friday, November 1st. Um, here in the Guild Room, and we would just like to invite the wider LGBTQ community and allies here at All Saints to our celebration. Um, the theme is going to be All Saints, appropriately enough, so we're going to encourage people to come in costume as your favourite saint, if you should <laughs> desire. Um, it'll be a fun time, it'll be a time to just celebrate our community um, and look forward to the future. Um, great. Is there anything else that you want to... And then just to announce too, in terms of looking at how we can start creating a little bit more events and small group, um, there is going to be, a little early, but there is going to be an advent group that's happening um, starting December 4th called, um, there's a title which I need to look at. It's a good one too, so that's why I need to make sure I'm following it through. Uh, it's preparing the way for LGBTQ justice. And so that would be, it's a three week uh, advent group that would be uh, meeting on uh, Wednesdays starting December 4th from uh, 7 to 8.30. So stay tuned for that. Uh, before I wrap up this part, I do want to give a shout out um, to really our, our staff member who's not here, but Susan Russell. She has been part of the uh, vision team. And so big shout out to Susan. I think you're watching. And so thank you so much. Um, and, and really to say, she almost just kind of gave, gave us the, the, just to, the inspiration, like, just go for it. And we did. And I think there's still more work ahead, but just, you know, we, we thank her for that. So that's my piece. And I'm going to hand it over to Hannah for some uh, Pronoun 101. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, and thank you so much for all of your hard work. Uh, it's a real honor to work alongside you. Um, so yeah, as I said before, my name is Hannah, my pronouns are they, them, and uh, one of the kind of needs identified as part of the survey was like a little bit more information on uh, what that actually means. Um, and so, uh, as mentioned earlier, I did actually record a podcast on this last year, so if you want to like a kind of deep dive into it, um, you can find that um, through the All Saints podcast, but I'll very quickly give... Um, some brief information about that as well. Um, I think the one thing that I want to convey to you all about pronouns is that don't overthink it and don't overcomplicate it in your head. When I say pronouns, and that's a bit of a technical term, and you might think, oh, no, oh, no, I don't really get what's going on. All we're really asking is that you use appropriate language when talking about people. The English language, when you're talking about someone else, um, contains information about their gender. And so, for example, if I was going to talk about someone that I know and say that he likes baseball and his dogs are really cute and I like to give him a hug after church, you don't need to know that I'm talking about Mike to know that I am talking about a man because the language that I use included the words he, him, and his. Those bits, those words are the pronouns. Those are the bits that um, give you uh, information about the person that I'm talking about. Similarly, if I was to tell you about someone you don't know and say that she plays violin, her hair is curly, I'm looking forward to seeing her in a few weeks when I go back to the UK, you know that I'm talking about a woman. Um, I'm, in fact, talking about my sister. Hey, Ruth. Um, <laughs> but um, you got that information from the words that I was using. I used the words she, her, her, and there. Those are the pronouns. And so, basically... Um, when someone asks you, please use he, him, or she, her, when talking about me, that's just to say, please talk about me as if I were a man, because I am a man, or as if I were a woman, because that is what I am. Um, so for me, for example, I said my pronouns are they, them, so what I'm asking you to do is to uh, talk about me as if I don't have a gender, because I do not. I am neither a man nor a woman. I'm non-binary. 
So, for example, you'd say something like, uh, this is Hannah, they're in the choir, and they sing in the alto section. So it's obvious from context that you're talking about an individual person, not a group of people, um, and also that the language that you're using doesn't contain gender information, so that communicates that, ah oh yes, Hannah is probably non-binary. Um, and, you know, that might, be, that might be new to some of you, you might not have had someone that you'd talk about in such a way before. But you do use singular they pronouns all the time when you talk about people whose gender you don't know. You maybe just don't quite notice it. So that's, that's all I'm asking you to do for me, is to use that same kind of language when talking about me. Um, and think about it this way. It's a sort of, um, it occupies the same sort of space in your mind as someone's name does. When you meet someone for the first time, you don't necessarily know what their name is. So they'll tell you their name, and then you remember it. And if you just sort of put someone's pronouns in that kind of same space in your mind and make that same effort to know what they are, uh, then you're all set, really. Um, so that's all that is. Basically, when someone introduces themselves to you and say, my pronouns are this, they're just saying, please talk about me in this kind of a way. Uh, so very simple, hopefully um, easy enough to, to pick up and understand. Um, and, yeah, um, basically the one other thing I think I'd want to say uh, before I pass on to Ella is that when you're talking about someone else, 90% of the time that person is not going to be there to listen to you talk about them. Um, and so the responsibility for using kind of correct pronouns and language really does lie with you. I'm not always going to be around to correct you if you make a mistake. Um, and even if I am, it's kind of a bit weird and awkward when someone gets it wrong and I'm spending a few seconds going, Ugh, and then by the time that I feel up to saying something, the conversation's already moved on. So try and, you know, be responsible of yourselves for using the correct language for people, correct each other, and that's just a really good way of supporting um, the transgender and non-binary people in the group. Hello, Mike. Hi, I have a question. Okay, yeah. what's your question? I use my pronouns. We know you're a man. You don't have to keep saying that. Why is it important for those of us whose gender feels to us like it is apparent from how we look to use our pronouns? Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so it is important as well for cisgender people, people who, you know, it's pretty obvious, right, um, to do that because it, it normalizes um, the idea of introducing yourself using your pronouns. Um, if people like Mike, if he introduces himself with his pronouns all the time, then it's, it's not weird that I'm going up and saying, like, my pronouns are they, them. It's a normal part of our conversation and our language. Um, it doesn't, it means that transgender people don't have to continually be outing themselves as trans and saying, I'm trans and this is a really important big deal in my life. It's just a normal part of conversation and of introductions. And so, yeah, cisgender people introducing themselves with their pronouns as well is just very helpful for us. And it's something that you can do as allies. Um, thank you very much for listening. We're uh, a little short on time, so I'm gonna hand off directly to Ella, who is another valued member of our LGBTQ visioning team, and she is going to tell you her story. Thanks, Hannah. So I'm Ella Baker. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a transgender lesbian woman. Um, I've always known who I am um, ever since I was a kid. I preferred female spaces. All my friends were girls. Um, I would dress up having admired my mom's, the strength of her beauty, um, in her clothes and shoes and put a t-shirt on my head because I wasn't allowed to grow my hair long and swish my hair back and forth. Um, but having been a member of a really conservative evangelical church community growing up, having a father who was a Marine and a career cop, a tiger Korean mom, I had a lot of pressure to be the firstborn son that they wanted and expected of me. So I tried very hard to do that. I tried for 30 years, um, and it was an abysmal failure. I was depressed. 
I had tried to commit suicide multiple times um, over the course of five or six years. And it was all coming to a tipping point where I didn't know how much longer I would be able to live as the performed self that I was expected to be. That all came to a head last Father's Day. Um, so I've been out for about a year. Um, last Father's Day, Father Mike Kinman had given a sermon that I believe was titled, Isn't There One More? And the subject of that sermon was on King David and the ways in which David was ostracized and otherized in his community and family. And how when the prophet was called to anoint the next king, David wasn't included in the sons. And the ways in which David's gender identity and perhaps even sexual orientation may have been a part of that exclusion. So I sat there sobbing through that entire sermon and realized that I could not continue performing any longer. I came out to my family that same day, which in retrospect may have been a mistake because Father's Day is sort of tainted for them. <laughs> um, and it's been a journey ever since. I knew that transitioning would come at a cost and it surely did come at a cost for me, um, quite a big cost. I was fired from my evangelical school where I had built a career. Um, I was divorced and I was ultimately disowned by my family. So one of the last things my mother said to me on the phone was, um, it's just like you're a murderer. Um, it feels that same way in my heart. So in that meantime though, not all has been a loss. I have learned to build beloved community and to find chosen family where it lies. And one of those main sources of beloved community and chosen family has been All Saints Church. So this past Easter, I've had the privilege to take part in a renaming ceremony, um, which was incredibly important for me to be able to stand up and affirm my identity, um, not only as a transgender woman, but as a Christian transgender woman who takes her faith very seriously. Um, and to be loved on by this community. So as we close, I just wanted to thank you all for stepping into that gap and being that community and that family of God to me. Um, you all reveal the face of Christ and I appreciate you all very much. That's what supportive community does look like when we're given the platform to tell our story. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we hope that this kind of was informative to you and stay tuned. Uh, there is gonna be more that's gonna come from this and um, do pray for this ministry um, and so that we can become kind of that, that, again, that visible force out into the church um, and out to, for the community. Uh, the three of us will be here. If you have questions or just wanted to approach us, we'll, we'll, we'll be here at the table. We have um, some uh, offerings. Uh, there are pronoun buttons if you would like to take some. There's also a, um, some pride rainbow flags and transgender flags. Do take one. Talk about visibility. Challenge. Maybe put it out in your garden. Um, and also there's some flyers. Um, and we also have a, a pronoun um, kind of informative flyers so that you can go and take it out and maybe leave it at Starbucks or something uh, with that. But again, thank you so much and um, have a good rest of your Sunday. Thank you. <laughs>